The on and off court drama at Wimbledon has only intensified as world number one Igor Swiatek is out of the tournament, while Emma Raducanu has faced backlash from much of the British public, including Andy Murray's mother, for a late mixed doubles withdrawal. Hey, my name is Christian Bassnight, and welcome to Christian's Court, where I cover tennis from all angles. Once again, if you have not already, make sure you subscribe to the channel to get notified whenever I post more women and updates throughout the tournament, and also help me reach my goal of making 15,000 subscribers before the slam ends. Now, getting into the news, of course, the big story of the day is world number one Igor Swiatek being bounced from Wimbledon by Kazakhstanian Yulia Putintseva, 3-6-6-1-6-2. This marks the end of Svantec's 21-match win streak, which spanned three titles at Madrid, Rome, and Roland Garros. This came as a shock to many tennis fans because Yulia is unseated, and she had never even claimed a set over the pole in their previous four matches. But I knew that this one was going to be a tough one for Iga, and I actually called Putintseva pulling off the upset. And I was very confused as to why people were not getting up for this match in, like, really considering Putinsova as a threat because she's in form she won a grass court title in Birmingham and she has done this before beating a top player on the grass as she beat Naomi Osaka and the woman in first round back in 2019 I guess I can kind of understand the point of oh uh Yulia has such a bad head-to-head -head against Iga but their matches have never been on the grass. And of course, grass is Iga's least favorite surface. I knew that Putintseva would have a tricky game style that would really trip up the Polish woman. And I honestly got a feeling that I was watching a dead woman walking in terms of like watching Iga play her previous rounds because I just felt like she just would not go deep in the tournament. I just wasn't getting like slam winner vibes from her at all. And it's not like she was playing awful. She just wasn't playing at a level I think that she should have been playing. Or needs to be playing in order to win this slam. If it wasn't Putintseva who would take her out, it was going to be Ostapenko in that round of 16. Of course, the Latvian infamously owes, owns a four to nothing head to head over Iga. So the loss low key shouldn't be too, too hard for the Iga fans. Not to mention, Paris Olympics are right around the corner. So she and her fans, once again, shouldn't be too, too pressed. Now, talking about the match, I actually thought Iga came out pretty strong and played decent to open things up. Iga served very well to open up the match in the first set as she hit 70% of first serves in and won 70% of points off both her first and her second serve. She also took advantage of Putin Seva's kind of mid poor serving to take the upper hand in the baseline exchanges, which aided in her getting the crucial loan break in the opener. Putin Seva started getting reads on this Shantek serve and I believe she had three break points at that 5-3 game. Now, Although she was not able to seize her opportunities there, that was a big sign for what was to come. Putintseva got her first break of the match, going up 3-1 in the second set, but the real big momentum shift, in my opinion, occurred in that 3-1 game. Now, there, Iga held three breakback points, and on the first breakback point, Putintseva was just was too solid. I think she had a running forehand winner, but on the second and third breakback points, it was really Iga making two routine return errors. It just Putin's was not that strong of a server. And it was just, I think, a lack of focus from Iga, just missing those easy returns. Iga's forehand also started to break down at this point too. And she also just was not effective on her second serve for sure. The stats just tell the story of the set, the second set, and really the third set too. And the two most glaring statistics are the 22% second serve points won from Iga and only one unforced error from the potence of a racket, which was huge. Both of these stats boil down to just Putintseva making Shantek play more balls. Putintseva, she made key adjustments and backed up off the baseline on return, especially on the second serve return, to make more balls in play, as a lot of times she was netting unnecessary uh, second serve returns. Iga went off court for about seven to eight minutes after dropping the second set, which is was controversial to some people as they thought it was gamesmanship. It is within the rules, so you know you can't really argue too much about it, but definitely it was to cool off Putintseva and and um, regain her composure. But it didn't help at all as Putintseva broke right off the bat at love. It was very reminiscent of the Ostapenko US Open fourth round match from 2023 as you would expect Iga to come back out after having the bathroom break and play well, but she, no, she just, it just was like a Titanic just went, it went from worse to worse, sir. And really Iga, she faded away while her opponent once again 
ran away with it. Potenziva played great and she for sure deserved to win. And I think one of her main assets too that I didn't mention before was her craftiness, mixing in a bunch of drop shots sometimes to which caught Iga off guard. And then two, slicing and being able to get, get on top of those cat and mouse points definitely helped her um in the key moments of this match now there were issues that Iga faced for sure and i think that they were confined to or mainly confined to this being on the grass the forehand which is a kind of a common denominator in Iga losses whenever she does lose a lot of times the forehand is just completely off and was just too error prone on that wing and her timing too just got messed up a lot especially towards the end and her stream spin too is not as not as effective on the grass and sometimes with when she has that spin it sits right up in her opponent's strike zone and that's why sometimes that forehand wasn't as effective against a Putinsova. Also, Iga's extreme forehand grip makes it harder for her to get under certain shots, especially those lower balls compared to the clay, where the balls typically bounce higher and in her strike zone. I also think that Iga's superior, supreme, good movement and defensive skills are not as valuable on this surface as... Um, she just struggled with footing a bit, which a lot of players do on the grass, as it's literally a grass court. But I think that some of that also comes from her just not playing any grass court lead-up tournaments. You know, I, we see players like Sinner and Djokovic able to slide on the grass, and I don't think we've really seen Iga have that same comfort or movement on the grass. So, for sure, I think it'll come with her as she plays more and more on the surface. But yeah, that thing that just boils down to not being as comfortable you know on the grass this year now another big topic of discussion that comes from this loss is Iga's poor slam performance aside from Roland Garros of course she's a four-time Roland Garros champion but at the since the start of 2023 she has not progressed past the quarterfinals at any of the other four majors and you know you think back she lost at the third round of this year's Australian Open nearly lost second round at the Australian Open and she really was a point away from losing literally a point away from losing at this year's um Roland Garros in the second round so for sure it tells me that Iga is more vulnerable at the earlier stages of the slams and I think you can too also have a discussion of like Iga comparatively having a quote-unquote easier draw than some other counterparts but to like you have to just bring it at the slams. You have to be on guard and know that these players are coming out to get you this early in the slams. That's something that Serena had to overcome a little bit in her career too, especially in that 2020, in that 2014 season. And Iga, I think, has to make some adjustments to where that she can possibly go deeper at the slams. Personally, I think it's kind of clear that Arena and Coco Golf are better slam players. Once again, you could argue that, oh, Arena and Coco have easier draws, yada, yada, yada. But regardless, they're consistently making the semifinals. Iga is not. She's falling early. And honestly, I have to say it again. She was very, I'm not going to say lucky, but she needs to be happy that she won that 2022 US Open because she was close to losing that in the, in the fourth round against Tanimeyer and in the semifinals of Sabalenka. But anyways, enough rambling on that subject and specifically talking about Iga on grass and her prospects of winning Wimbledon one day. I think she can for sure win it. Of course, we all know she won the girls title here in 2018. And I also think with how her serve has been rapidly improving year by year, there's no reason why she cannot. I think once again, a big factor of why she was not able to go as far as she could have this year was just due to the lack of preparation she had on the grass and Iga also mentioned in her press conference that she was tired she regrets not having a vacation after Roland Garros she played a lot more Matt I think a lot more recently and having to play Madrid Rome and Roland Garros and Madrid and Rome were two weeks and Roland Garros of course two weeks long so that's a lot on your body so for sure I think Eagle will take this as a lesson and use it next year too and once again I also think that probably she wasn't as pressed about doing well on the grass of course she doesn't want to lose but her main priority I think this year is are the Paris Olympics and I think that it'll be good that she probably has a little bit more time to go back on her favorite surface the clay and prepare and hopefully try to go for that gold medal so I really do not think that Iga fans should be that beat up and bent out of shape about the loss if anything if there was a loss to be had this would be a good one as they probably don't want another loss to Ostapenko now regardless I do want to reiterate how well Yulia Putintseva played 
just unbelievable tennis. So full props to her. She just outplayed Iga at the end. Now, Putintseva now plays Yelena Ostapenko in the fourth round, which is sure to be a firecracker as both of those two women have just big personalities. Another result that might have surprised some people from today is back-to-back runner-up Ons Jabur, losing to 21st seed Alina Svitolina 6-1-7-6. I really would not have expected this result coming into this tournament because Ons had decent form and then Alina did not have great form, but Svitolina, she did make the semifinals here last year, so she clearly she feels at home. I think that Svitolina will be the favorite in her fourth round match where she takes on the unseated Xin Yu Wang, who etched out a 2-6, 7-5, 3 comeback win over Brit Harriet Dart. Even with Iga and Ons out, the top half is still very stacked as three slam champions remain in Yelena Ostapenko, Barbora Krachikova, and Elena Rybakina. People have been saying that it's Coco's tournament to lose now that Iga's out, and I really do not agree with that because there are quite a few big hitters left in the draw, and the big hitters are the ones that tend to trouble golf the most. Now, those big hitters are primarily in the top half, and I think the title favorite to me clearly is Elena Rabakina, who got a very, very impressive 6-love, six 6-1 six win over fellow slam champion Caroline Wozniacki. The road is still very challenging for Rabakina as she now faces the Berlin runner-up Anna Kalinskaya, who beat her compatriot Lumbella Samsonova in straight sets. Barbora Krachikova will make her return to the second week here at SW19, and she'll meet Daniel Collins, who on her last appearance here at the cha championship will be making her first round of 16 appearance. Collins has not yet dropped a set this tournament, and she recently netted a solid 6-4, 6-4 win over 20th seed Beatrice Haddad Maya. I am going to be rooting for an Ostapenko Collins quarterfinal. To me, Ostapenko would be the favorite to make that semifinal, as she's been just breezing past her opponents thus far, only dropping 10 games en route to the last 16. Now, Emma Raducanu was also into the fourth round, but she might have a few physical question marks in her next match against Lulu Sun tomorrow. Today, Raducanu pulled out of the mixed doubles competition, where she was set to play alongside Andy Murray, who confirmed that this will be his last woman in championships. The two-time singles champ Murray already played doubles with his brother Jamie, losing in round one, and he was unfortunately unable to compete in singles due to having to recover from his back cyst surgery. They had a nice ceremony for Andy on center court after his doubles loss, but people expected his last true farewell Wimbledon match to come alongside Raducanu in the mixed doubles. However, the Brit made a statement confirming her withdrawal, saying, unfortunately, I woke up with some stiffness in my right wrist this morning, so therefore, I've decided to make the tough decision to withdraw from the mixed doubles tonight. The scheduling of that was not ideal. Raducanu unfortunately received a lot of backlash for her withdrawal, a lot of people were calling her selfish, a brat, and everything under the sun for taking this poor woman away from Andy Murray. And apparently there were reports that Murray was gutted by this. I don't know how true that is. But even Andy's mama, uh, Judy Murray, she made a shady dig at the 21-year-old, replying, yes, astonishing, to a tweet from someone by the name of Marcus Buckland. Now, after facing the backlash, Judy locked her Twitter account, so clearly she didn't want no smoke from the Raducanu defenders. And I really think the Raducanu hate for the situation is ridiculous. If you know tennis, you know the girls, her body is made of glass and she did undergo surgery on both of her wrists last year. So she definitely is not used to playing this much tennis, much tennis as she has been in the past month or so. So I think there's actually an injury concern for her, especially she has a great opportunity at going deep in this singles event. I think she's a good has a good shot at making the semifinals. So why would she risk it playing with Andy, even though it is his last tournament? That's more of doing him a favor and instead of bettering her. I also have to get on Murray for even asking Emma to play with him. I understand probably, you know, he wanted to have this passing of the torch moment from one US, o Brit US Open champ to another, but really he should have stuck with someone like a Harriet Dart. You knew Harriet Dart was not going to go that, that far in this tournament. And Dart, I believe she made the mixed doubles final um, a year or so back too. So she probably would have been a much better option. She would have graveled at Andy Murray's, um, at the opportunity to play with Andy Murray. So low key, that's on you, Andy. Love you, buddy, but you should have chose a better mixed doubles partner. Andy already also, like I said, he already did his farewell with his brother, Murray, Jamie. And I think that would have been a problem 
more proper last moment of match than play with Emirato Kanu. I don't think those two would have gone that far anyways because Rado Kanu, she doesn't, she's not that great of a doubles player um, or she doesn't have that much experience playing doubles. So once again, Andy, you should have chosen a better doubles partner. That's on you, bro. Also, it's not even his last ever match. He will be playing in the Paris Olympics next month or later this month. So, you know, he'll have a better uh, swan song than that. It's really not that deep, y'all. Get over it. Anyways, unlike with the Mormon, everything practically went according to plan on the men's side today. Novak got through another four-set test, besting Aussie Alexei Popperin. 4-6-6-3-6-4-7-6. He'll now get Holger Rune in a spicy fourth round affair. The Danes survived the French qualifier Quentin Halley's recovering from two sets to love down to win 1-6-6-7-6-4-7-6-6-1. Alex Di Menor received a walkover into the fourth round after Luca Puy pulled out citing an injury issue. Di Menor will face another Frenchman in Arthur Fies who will be making his first them second week appearance after beating Roman Safulin in five sets. A great win for Fies as Safulin is a great grass court player and he, the Russian, made the quarterfinals here last year. Joining Arthur in the round of 16 is his good friend and compatriot Giovanni and Petri Petticard, who beat Emil Ruzuvari in four sets. The six foot eight Frenchman would now face 25th seed Lorenzo Musetti. I think that's a great opportunity for Gio to make his first ever quarterfinal, which is incredible considering how he like started the year just solely playing challenger events. So that just shows you how much talent he has being able to have that big rise like that. And then Taylor Fritz and Alexander Zverev will meet for the ninth time after those two picked up straight sets wins over Alejandro Tabilo and Cam Noy respectively. Yannick Sinner, Grigor Dimitrov, Carlos Alcaraz, and Tommy Paul already had booked their spots in round four yesterday, but they low-key have an advantage as their upcoming opponents all have to finish the job today. Top seed Yannick Sinner has the biggest advantage as he now plays Ben Shelton, who played practically all of his five setter against Shapovalov today. This was a great win for Ben, being able to navigate that battle and come through against his fellow lefty Denis Shapovalov, making his first fourth round appearance here at Wimbledon. I think it was a big moment for him too because he was kind of in a somewhat of a rough patch as far as not having a lot of confidence. So regardless of what happens against Yannick, I think for sure he can carry this solid performance into the hardcore season. Also fun fact, Ben's father, Brian Shelton, who is also his coach, reached the Wimbledon fourth round 30 years ago in 1994. So talk about like father, like son. Dimitrov faces Dino Medvedev, who finished out his four set victory over Yannick. Lennart Ugo Umber only needed to win his four set tiebreak today over Brandon Nakashima to advance and face Alcaraz. Carlitos needs to be aware of the big serving lefty for sure because I think that Umber, if he's hot too, can surely trouble Alcaraz and really pull off the upset. And then Tommy Paul will be the considerable favorite when he takes on 36 year old Spaniard Roberto Bautista Agut, who finished out Fabio Fonini in five sets. Looking ahead to day seven, Alcaraz will open and play against Umber, followed by Raducanu, who plays New Zealand qualifier Lulu Sun. Coco will conclude play there with an all-American battle between she and Emma Navarro. On court one, there's the battle of the biracials between Jasmine Paolini and Madison Keys, followed by Yannick Sinner and Ben Shelton, and then Dimitrov and Medvedev. Court one, low key looks better than center court, y'all. And then finally, court two singles matches. The two ones there are between Paula Badosa and Donna Vekic, followed by Tommy Paul, who faces, of course, Roberto Bautista Agut. That's it for my day six Wimbledon recap. And let me know in the comments how y'all feel about Iga in this upset and whether y'all were indeed shocked by it or if you were more like me and were expecting a result like this. Also, do you think that Shiontek has a minor issue in the slams aside from Roland Garros? And then two, who do you think would be the favorite in that top half at least to make the finals on the women's side and then who do you think will make the finals on the men's side again make sure y'all subscribe and click the notification bell so you're notified whenever i post more edgy content woman and content before the tournament ends thank y'all so much again for watching i'm christian and i'll see y'all next time christian's crew here on christian's court